Hi everyone, welcome back to Vedic Life Coaching. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome back to the troubleshooting series. Today we are at the final episode here with Ketu. We are looking at the last planet in the series. I was thinking about doing an episode on the outer planets. I was thinking about doing an episode on Earth and looking at free will and all kinds of different things. But do you know what? This feels right. And here we are with Ketu. It has to be about how we feel. And another thing about this whole series, as I was reflecting back on this work, is that a lot of it has been guided. And it's very appropriate for me to raise that here in the Ketu episode. Because here in the Ketu episode, we are looking at the place in our chart where we can access past life information, where we can access even ancestral information, things, things we've done in past lives, ancestral information, information that's being guided as well. Ketu is deeply spiritual. And, you know, we're going to get into some of the details here, but I just thought I'd kick this off by stating, yes, just, just how spiritual Ketu is. All right, so we're looking at my top five Ketu remedies. Why don't we get into this episode? Now, if you watched last time's Rahu episode, and I'll link it above so that you can go and have a look at that, because in that one at the beginning, I talk about who are Rahu and Ketu? Why do they have the names Rahu and Ketu? And a quick recap, I will just tell you very quickly, Rahu is the north node of the moon and Ketu is the south node of the moon. And we've covered Rahu. Here we are with Ketu, the south node of the moon. This is the place of mastery. So wherever that is in your chart, you have mastered something in past lives. Or you become very good at something. It's your comfort zone, okay? This is the place where you are secure, you are confident. You know what you're doing in this area of your life. It doesn't challenge you, it doesn't test you. And we like to be there, don't we? And very often we will be there right up until age 48. Okay, Ketu mature is age 48. And there can be lessons and things that come up around the age of 48. And yeah, some of your karmas in relation to Ketu might be maturing at that time. All right. But when I talked about the myths and how they got their names, I explain how Rahu is the head without the body. And you have to watch the story to hear the full news on that. But here we are with Ketu, the body without the head. And I thought about this, I contemplated this. And I think at the beginning of this, I did say, didn't I, that this was guided, this, this whole series. And what I've been doing is I've been taking, I've got my notes here. Uh, and I've been taking my notebook to the cafe every weekend on the Saturday morning, typically. And I'll just sit there and I'll write notes for this series. And I look at the strength of the planet, I look at the weakness, and then I come up with the five tips. And a lot of those tips have just been purely guided. You know, and I've had ideas, but then things will get written down and I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's quite good. So this episode is, is just like all of them, and I think it's my K2 placement that has really been helping me uh, do all of this work on this occasion. Why did I go down that tangent? Oh yeah, because the body without the head, right. So I'm the least prepared, by the way, for this episode. All the other episodes had a lot more thought. This one, I've just kind of come to it because my week has been very busy. But Ketu is the body without the head. And I was contemplating this on the weekend at the cafe, thinking about, right, the body without the head. I've got some notes here. The head contains the main sensory organs. Okay, so when we look at the head of a person, we've got our eyes here where we see. We've got our ears here. This is where we hear things. We've got all the taste buds on our tongue. We can taste things. We have our nose up here with the head, right? So we can smell things. And the head, of course, is very sensitive to touch as well. Sometimes some people, and I've known people like this, who when there are far too many clouds, 
in the sky they actually get pressure headaches right isn't that incredible so touch you know the head can be very sensitive when it comes to touch now when you don't have the head right all of those sensory organs are not there and when you're left with just the body we've got you know really one main sense of of feeling of touch we can feel things and anytime you do any psychological work or self-development work self-help work and you're dealing with an uncomfortable emotion they always say where do you feel it in your body and they say specifically body and few people say it's in the head few people will say oh I really feel that you know especially around the heart people feel things around the heart a lot uh, people can feel things you know in the solar plexus area in in the organs you know all these kind of areas is where we really tend to feel things so touch is a really unique sense in that we feel it all over the body sometimes what happens in these self-help workshops and things like that I had this happen just I think two three weeks ago I was on a session on a zoom call and the coach was asking her where do you feel that how do you feel and I said I actually feel really freezing cold I felt absolutely cold everywhere it was incredible so that one's quite interesting that touch is a sense that we feel all over the body uh, I've got the note here that the body has a sixth sense and I knew that there was some kind of sixth sense just to do with the body I google searched it and I can put a link for you it's the sixth sense is called I'm going to have to see if I can pronounce this pro proprio or proprio I think it said proprio when it because it told you how to say it proprioception okay so this is an actual thing that you know scientists are trying to study right now and they don't understand it and there's a lot to discover and learn in this field so it's pretty incredible and I think if one studies astrology like if the scientists could also look at astrology and study Ketu at the same time of studying this incredible phenomenon that is proprioception if they could do both at the same time they would figure out a whole load of things because I think the ancients have got this covered and they've mapped a lot of this stuff out anyway uh, I've also got here that you know when it comes to being psychic and clairvoyant and clairaudient and all these kinds of things I was thinking about it. I'm not really very psychic or any of that I don't really know like when I look at a chart things just open up for me and I just I get things and things work I, I, I understand that but uh, I'm not psychic at all but some people will be psychic and they'll be either clairvoyant they can see they're clairaudient you know they can hear things I did have clear audience one time where an actual voice said to me help this woman this was like a long time ago in London and I was at a Tesco and anyway this lady said that she lost her wallet and I'm standing right next to her doing something completely different I'm, I'm at the checkout paying for my groceries but I, I heard very audibly a voice say help this woman and I did that and that's a whole big story because you know I ended up getting to know her and then making a whole bunch of friends through her it was a whole big thing anyway I'm sure I know her from a past life and you see that is Ketu that is when you're dealing with Ketu you'll have this feeling that I know this person from a past life you will have these things happen unusual things will happen but we've got these clairs clair audience clair audience clairvoyance and there are others if I find them I'll, I'll put them on the screen but the one I wanted to talk about is clairsentience and this is very Ketu Ketu is clairsentient you just know with your entire being you just know you you have the answer and and sometimes it can be like a feeling so I think this is the one that I am of all the different clairs I'm clairsentient sometimes I just know things and especially when I'm working with a chart uh, something there opens up for me and yeah things happen sometimes that I can't even explain so now if your Ketu is too strong how do you know if your Ketu is too strong so throughout this series we have been looking at you know if the planet is too strong too weak after this series I'm going to do just one Astro Chat episode about how to work out if a planet is strong or weak 
So we're going to take a look at that for sure. Okay, so now how can you tell if your Ketu is too strong? So I gave this quite a bit of thought. This is an interesting realm to figure out if Ketu is too strong or too weak. And I'll tell you some of my slight dilemmas here because when you read so many astrology books you will discover that there are a lot of conflicts and contrasts between what different authors say. So some people will say that Ketu is like Pisces, some people will say Ketu is like Scorpio, so similar to, so you can kind of think about what's going on in Pisces and Ketu is similar to that, which I feel is quite strong of all the different theories that are going on. Uh, Ketu is like Scorpio, I, I can see that as well. People liken Rahu to Saturn, but which of the two Saturns? So is it Capricorn or Aquarius? Well, yes, it's Aquarius. So that's pretty obvious there. But with Ketu, is Ketu like Pisces? Is Ketu like Scorpio? These are things that people debate. Uh, people say Ketu is exalted in Scorpio. It's debilitated in Taurus. So again, is Ketu ever exalted? I don't really believe in that. I don't think Rahu or Ketu are particularly exalted or debilitated anywhere. I think with Rahu, Rahu particularly likes to be in the third house Gemini, sixth house Virgo. I definitely see that. But it's really quite interesting. Some people also look at Rahu Ketu along the Sagittarius Gemini line and say that you know they excel there and things like that. I don't particularly subscribe to any of these things. Isn't that interesting? But if I had to liken Ketu to something, I, I do go for Pisces and or Scorpio. I'm kind of evenly weighted on both of those. Um, now if Ketu is too strong, Ketu might be conjunct a lot of planets or a lot of planets are on the Ketu side of the chart, or the Lord of Rahu is with Ketu. Okay, so that's indicating an emphasis on past, past life issues, clearing up karma, you know, that kind of work in, in this lifetime. I've got here a strong 8th house, a strong 12th house. These can indicate, uh, you know, more we're kind of looking for more moksha energy we're looking for more water energy that's how i see this i see ketu as water i think that's one of the sim simplest ways to look at ketu strong scorpio strong pisces you're also looking for ketu ruled nakshatras so that's ashwini maga and mula nakshatra okay when you've got strong energy uh, in any one of those three, and especially Ashwini and Mula, especially Ashwini and Mula, I see these energies as being very healing. This person will have healing power through uh, these nakshatras. But if your Ketu is too strong, what are some of the signs? Let's say you don't have your chart and you just want to look at the life and see what it is. Well, the first thing is you will have occult gifts. Okay, so if Ketu is very strong in your chart, you will have some kind of occult gifts. Uh, another thing is that people can't pigeonhole you, okay? And this is a really interesting thing. People won't be able to pigeonhole you. If they meet you, they won't be able to work out where you are from. They won't have a clue. They'll look at you, they'll look at your body, but there's something about you physically where they can't pin you down. They can't work out where you were born or where you're from or your ethnicity, or there's something about you that is just very difficult for people to pin down. They can't figure you out. Another thing about Ketu being really strong is that you'll have access to lifetimes of wisdom. And I've got a fourth one here, I'm being greedy. Uh, you will crave freedom, okay? Freedom will be your number one goal. That is what you will want, okay? And that's moksha, liberation, you want freedom, that's your goal. Your whole life and goal is about freedom. Freedom from what? Well, now I think this is the title of one of Krishnamurti's books. I'm pretty sure it's titled Freedom from the Known. And that's, that's a pretty good uh, little description right there, possibly of what Ketu is about. Freedom from the known, freedom from external things, uh, you know, all that kind of thing. Now, what if your Ketu is weak? All right, so... And I was trying to look at charts, like who could I think of 
that would have a weak Ketu. Well, and just quickly, I mean, I might as well. I've got, I'll pull up the chart very quickly of Osho uh, on the strong Ketu side of things. I mean, if we look here at his chart, you'll see that he does have a lot of water energy, water energy in the air houses. So that's pretty interesting right there. And they're pretty strongly lit. We've got Jupiter retrograde there with the moon as the Lord. So that's kind of like a Gaj Kesari type thing there. We've got Sun in the seventh house. We've got Rahu there in Pisces. And we've got this water house, the eighth house, that's absolutely full. And it's got a lot of really uh, key planets in there. So we can see that there's a lot of water here. But now let's take a look at a weak Ketu. All right, so weak Ketu, an example of this. Now I was thinking, who can I think of that's really materialistic? And I looked at the chart of Bill Gates and that, yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's quite a materialistic sort of a chart. But then I looked at the chart of Adolf Hitler and I thought, yeah, I think we've got one here. This is quite... Uh, there's not much water here at all. If you have a look at the chart, it's very dry, especially with these four planets here in Aries in the seventh house. Okay, so we've got an air house, it's just full of fire. It's a stellium as well, so it's big, heavy energy. A lot of the focus is there. Okay, so a lot of fire and air. Uh, not a lot of water. And the place where there is a little bit of water, We've got Cancer there, but it's in the earthy house of Capricorn. And we've got Aries, Saturn seated there. So there's really not a lot of water here in this chart with Adolf Hitler, okay? So we can see that this is someone who has a weak Ketu, a weak uh, Moksha energy, not much water, okay? So what are the symptoms of a weak Ketu? Well, I would say that this person would be more materialistic uh, they may judge spiritual people and they love science, they love definitions, but they don't like ambiguity, you know, and they, they want to have their feet on solid ground. And I can imagine ambiguity makes them feel pretty uncomfortable. I did also look, when I was coming up with the notes for this earlier in the week, I was looking at charts of people like Richard Dawkins and things like that. I will explore that in future episodes, looking at you know, the charts of people who definitely don't believe in God. He's, he's an odd one because, now let's see if I've still got him up here. Yeah, I do. He does have, uh, you know, some energy here that's very watery and it's kind of, he's kind of mm, drawn to spirituality, even though he's just attacking it the whole time. But he's, he's a very interesting person to study. So who knows, maybe we might look at him. But let's take a look at my top tips, shall we? So top tip number one, how to improve your Ketu energy. Top tip number one is study astrology. Isn't that interesting? What an interesting remedy here that if you want to improve Ketu energy, all you have to do is watch videos like this or read your astrology books, study your chart. Any of those things are really, really good especially studying your chart, that's brilliant. Self-study of your own chart is enormously illuminating and really important, I think, if you're on any kind of self-development journey where you want to improve yourself in your life. It's really good to have a map. It's really good to see in an abstract way certain some of the placements and what they mean. And as you study astrology, you will learn so many things about yourself. And that's really powerful it's a really good thing uh, I've got here by studying any occult field really so you know even if you're studying any anything any occult thing that you that you love and you're drawn to there's something there for you and that's going to be important and with Ketu it's very much this thing of you're revealing something you already know so I think there's one of the quotes I have in my, and I, if I've only got it here, I don't have it here, no. It's my Stoic Wisdom Tarot deck, which I have been working on. It will be available for sale in a few weeks. But in that deck, I've got a quote by one of the Stoics, which says something like education, oh, and I'm doing this from memory. Let's see, education is merely the kindling of a flame. It's like education is not, you know, stuffing yourself with knowledge. It's the kindling of a flame. And I tend to think that it is, and I'll put it on my, by my side if I find it. 
I tend to think that education is, um, yes, it could be the kindling of a flame and that's very uh, poetic and beautiful and apt actually astrologically because you know the ninth house of higher education where Sagittarius is that is fire so that's perfect that's an astrologically accurate statement that the Stoics made but I tend to think that education is also like a, it's like a revealing it's kind of like revealing what you already know and this will be something you're revealing what you already know from past lives. This is information you've already acquired, you already know it, you already understand it. So for me, the top tip has to be, the, the first top tip that we have has to be studying because we've got Ketu ruling Mula Nakshatra. And of course, Mula Nakshatra, you know, there in that ninth house kind of area is very much all about going deep into research, studying, figuring things out. And that's enormously healing. And beneficial. Top tip number two, deconstruct ego. This is an interesting one. This is the place here in Ketu where we come to deconstruct our ego. Okay, so when we're in the Rahu house, we are constructing our ego. We are using Rahu to construct our world, life around us, you know, who we are and our place in the world and what it is that we've come here to do. And a lot of what Rahu will get you to do will be things like constructing ego. Now, is ego all bad? Well, no, it's not. There's, there's healthy ego as well. So when you create a LinkedIn profile, for example, you are putting yourself out there that's a little that's a bit that's a bit of ego isn't it you know you're putting yourself out there and you're hoping to get work and create opportunities in the outside world and i think creating a linkedin profile is an example of healthy ego these are important things we should be doing stuff like that and rahu will get you to do things like that but then if you're in the rahu house too much and things aren't going so well there we come back to our ketu position where we can reflect and we can deconstruct whatever ego we had to create out there in the Rahu house. We can deconstruct it. We can see, okay, what did I do wrong? Did I, did I do something wrong? You know, uh, maybe sometimes you just need a rest in the Ketu house. It's not much more than that. But equally, if some, we do make mistakes in that Rahu house. We come back to Ketu. We deconstruct the ego. We take a look. We have a look and our awareness goes up especially if we are courageous and we look at ourselves very honestly. Okay, so that's really important. Can you look at yourself with total honesty and deconstruct your ego, figure out your part in the situation or whatever it is that went wrong in the Rahu house that's caused you to come back to Ketu to get some rest in the Ketu house. So definitely top tip two is deconstruct ego. And I have notes here like studying yourself, studying self-help, psychology, you know, to see your part in the problem is doing the real work. But I think we're going to cover that in a, in a further tip, in one of the tips further on. All right, top tip number three, don't stop completely. Now this kind of links into, I think it was top tip three in the Rahu episode, which was keep going. So again, I'm suggesting that, you know, wherever you are, if you're in Rahu, if you're in Ketu, the idea is you don't stop totally. Now Ketu will sometimes get you to stop and take breaks. And this is where Ketu is a lot like Scorpio because Scorpio is that part of the zodiac where things do stop. Okay, so we've got Mars lording Aries and Scorpio Aries and Scorpio are two sides of Mars and in Aries it's go 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 but in Scorpio it can be stop. Scorpio is the place of stop. Very often we stop there. Uh, stopping can happen, discontinuity, breaks, you know, and that's very often where career changes happen or big changes in relationships can happen or massive transformations. So how you've been all your life, you might stop and you might change completely when you're in you're doing the transformation work that is there in Scorpio. So Ketu is very much like Scorpio and yeah this top tip three don't stop completely I think is well you might need to 
Maybe that you need to stop completely. That is true, that is possible. But I do tend to think you can always keep a little bit of Rahu going. When you're with Rahu, you can always keep a little bit of Ketu going. You know, you can always study uh, your ego and self-reflect and be aware. You can keep Ketu going uh, while you're in that Rahu house as well. So yeah, I do have the note here in Ketu, you are meant to stop or take breaks. That, that will happen. In your life, you will there will just be times where you have to take take some serious time out or stop something altogether, start something brand new. But if you are going through, and for example, if you're going through like a 12th house transit, and I know this one all too well, when Saturn's 12th from a significant place in your chart, you know, you will experience, you can experience burnout, you have to take time out and things like that. I've got the note here that you can keep Rahu stimulated by, so let's say you have to be off the playing field of life for a time and be at home a lot more and not be as engaged and all that kind of thing. Well, when you're in that phase, through Rahu, your Rahu placement, you can window shop. You can kind of just see, well, what would I like to do? when this time in my life changes or ends or transforms because it will you will if you're going through a phase where things aren't so busy a phase will come where you're hugely busy and you're needed in the world and you're doing a lot so don't worry that time will come so try to enjoy the downtime while you can as well i think that's another tip as well enjoy the downtime all right now we've got tip num top tip number four surrender attack this one's quite interesting. So surrender attack, what do I mean here? I've been reading a book by Chuck Spezzano called, I think it's called Creating Heaven on Earth, The Language of the Heart, something like that. I'll put it up by my side. It's a really, really good book. And what he's doing in this book is he's looking at the energy of attack and self-attack, and he's getting you to see it, see yourself doing it, see how you attack and how you attack your own self. And he's getting you to give that up. He's getting you to transcend, rise above all the programs of attack and self-attack. And there are so many, you know, uh, attack can be things like judgment, blaming, complaining, criticizing. These can all be subtle forms of attack. And yeah, I'm definitely trying to lessen how much I do all of these things. It's a journey, you know, there's always work to be done. But yeah, and I've got the note here, you may not do this to others, you may not really attack others. And I, I don't do that so much, but like, um, yeah, I do attack myself, I've done that, where I'm hard on myself or all this kind of thing. So, and all these things are very subtle. With the ego, the ego is so slick and it's so subtle and it's so clever and it's so deceptive. Ego is just, it, it is a very, ego is an, a very intelligent uh, construct or thing, you know, it, 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 it knows survival really, really well because it fears death, you know, ego doesn't want to die and we are eternal beings, right? And this Ketu part of us, I think Ketu and Sun in our charts really represent where we are eternal, you know. Sun contains that energy as well. All right, top tip five, surrender want programs. So this is kind of similar to what we were doing in top tip four, surrender attack. Okay, so attack is where we are. And sometimes in attack, we are defending, we're defending our territory or defending what we've created or what we believe in, all that kind of thing. But surrendering want programs, this is where we are surrendering desire. You know, um, and one of the ways to look at this is to ask ourselves, why are we doing all this self-study? Or why are we studying psychology? Why are we interested in astrology? And I've been thinking about this quite a bit because I've been seeing some similarities between the realm of psychology and the realm of astrology. Both, you know, so practitioners in both realms have a similar goal that we want to be able to predict future events. Now in psychology, 
they're mapping out dynamics and patterns so that people can predict someone's behavior you know and in astrology we're looking at predicting psychology and behavior as, as well as events you know and astrology is very ambitious right in terms of what it wants to do but it's so interesting that in both realms we want to you know we want something right and what is it that we want and I've got the note here we want to predict the future okay but why do we want to do that and we're doing that because we want to control outcomes we want to control life in some way so at the heart of Ketu is a lot of control and this is definitely something I have been looking at within myself because that's what came up in my coaching session that I went to I think it was two or three weeks ago however long it was <clears throat> and it was you know it, it occurred to me that wow just how much energy of mine goes into controlling life to make it safe and that is a very Ketu thing Ketu is a place of safety and it's a place where we know what we're doing and you know we're comfortable and comfort zone and control control is there as well so I have a note here if you are conscious of this in your study of these precious tools so the precious tools given by psychology or astrology uh, you can open up more power yes now this is quite interesting I've got written here spiritual power is given to those who will either not use it uh, or they definitely won't abuse it but they may not even use it right so spiritual power is fascinating and <clears throat> one of the things about it is that it means you can't be controlled by the outside world uh, and yeah you're given more spiritual power the ones who are given lots and lots of spiritual power are the ones that they never use it you know and I think I talked about that in the pick a card I recorded today uh, I think it's group number three so oops I, have, I haven't spoiled that for anyone but um, I think it's within that uh, reading that I did that this this actually came up which is so interesting because yeah the most powerful person is the one who has lots and lots of power but doesn't need to use it like you got a lot of muscle but you don't need to flex kind of thing you know or like um, and this is this is the total opposite to the 3d world you know but if you look at the 3d world because I was thinking about this I was thinking about well who's the most powerful person and it's always like you know it, Hollywood and that has made it seem like well the president of the United States is the most powerful person but when I look at that I see that well they're the most controlled person with the least power 3d power is just not very attractive at all well, it's not very attractive to a highly spiritual person or a very Ketu kind of person but yeah this is so interesting spiritual power you will have loads and loads of power with the ability to do all kinds of things like by locate and read people's minds and walk through walls and whatever it is you have all these powers but you have no need to use them you know it's, it's really fascinating so those are my top tips for this series I want to thank I want to thank everyone who has watched every single episode thank you so much for being part of this journey it has been so much fun and I really look forward to your comments on this one let me know how you got on with this episode in the comments below and I look forward to seeing you next time Thank you.